Nicolas Bornos of Capital Link, and I'm delighted to welcome you to another great panel of today's forum. This particular panel on industry preparedness for COP26 and its aftermath is dealing with one of the most critical uh, topics that the industry, the maritime industry, is facing day to day. And uh, this panel comes right after the official remarks of Ms. Kelly Speaks uh, uh, Backman, uh, who gave us the U.S. government perspective on uh, the zero mission for, for shipping, uh, as her office is uh, and herself are leading that uh, particular mission. I will turn over the, uh, uh, the floor to Knut Erbert Nielsen, uh, the CEO of DNV Maritime, uh, to uh, introduce our panelists. I'd like to thank each one of you for your participation today uh, and Thank you, Knut, for being a great partner of our events uh, uh, across the globe. So thank you to all of you. You've all been supporting our events uh, in, in more than one way. And thank you for joining today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas, for the introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you all uh, to today's panel discussion here at Capital Link. And uh, as Nicholas said, the, the topic is industry preparedness for COP26 and its aftermath. And my name is Knut Olbeck Nilsson. I'm the CEO of DNV Maritime, and I will be your host uh, today. Now, we have an excellent lineup today, and I, for one, am really looking forward to hearing our esteemed experts' views on the next round of UN Climate Talks, or COP26. But before we begin, let me introduce you to our panel. So first, Mrs. Louis Sabrocki, CEO of International Seaways. Welcome. Mr. Cameron McKay, COO of Energy Incorporated. Mr. John C. Wobben Smith, of President and CEO of Genco Shipping and Trading. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Bo Serup Simonson, the CEO of Maersk McKinney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping. Now, thank you all very much for joining us today and a warm welcome to Capital Link. It's great to see so many influences, influential voices uh, coming together. Now, we just heard um, the keynote from Mrs. Kelly Speaks Backman of U.S. Department of Energy stating the U.S. administration's aggressive approach to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions and achieve net zero by 2050. So to decarbonize the shipping sector, U.S. together with Denmark and Norway launched uh, the zero emission shipping mission to develop, test and demonstrate zero emission shipping and to scale up production and port infrastructure of green ammonia, green methanol, hydrogen and sustainable biofuels. She concluded all hands on deck. Now, with that as a backdrop, we have together 45 minutes to discuss COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference, which is only weeks away. And we'll see about 197 nations and territories come together to try and hash out a more detailed agreement on climate change actions. And with the IPCC report recently declaring a code red, the setting is primed for enhanced political pressure to ensure real and tangible progress leading up to 2030 and beyond. But what will that mean for shipping? And how far have we already come in tackling decarbonization? That is the focus of our discussion today. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. And um, if I may turn to you, Luis, with the first question. So uh, some may argue that the IMO's greenhouse gas goals and the declared ambitions of several influential regional players have already set in motion significant changes in maritime. Now, this begs the question, how relevant is COP26 for shipping? Louise, please. No, absolutely. Thank you. So we know that at COP26 directly does not influence shipping. However, we also know that IMO will take direction from COP26 
and it's likely that we in shipping will come on uh, you know under heightened pressure and even potentially tightening regulation and the marine environment protection committee will also take lead from cop 26 and i i think these are uh, you know, we're at much more of a tipping point than we ever have been in previous years where things were more theoretical than they are today. And it, it seems to me that in shipping, things will become uh, less commoditized. And what I mean by that is, you know, we become used to, you know, in tanker shipping, you know, we become used to a very, uh, you know, you're gonna fix an MR, you're gonna fix a BLCC, and it's really a commodity where what we will likely see going forward will be customers with discrete requirements, potentially working with various owners as partners, where you can come up with, uh, you know, routes that might facilitate, you know, you know, a short run with batteries where, or a long run um, with dual fuel. LNG capability like we're doing on the Shell project. So, um, I, you know, I do think that things will only um, become tighter from here. Great, thanks for those uh, comments, Luis. Maybe I can turn to you, uh, Cam, and, and hear your take on, on the COP26 meeting, please. Uh Thank you. Um, I agree with Lois. I, I would say I don't think COP26 is highly relevant to our industry. And I don't think if you look back at the previous 40 to 50 years, that even the IMO has been that relevant at times of change. I think that the real question is when political pressure is increasing, how and where does it manifest itself in sequence and that you get to, you know, the expression all politics are local, you get ports, you have states, but it is the last uh, part of the sequence for uh, regions or the UN to take action. And so that's how we are accustomed, I think, in our industry to piecemeal regulations, a very uneven playing field uh, with different levels of compliance and different standards across different jurisdictions. And in this matter, which is undoubtedly existential, um, I do agree with Lois is that the underlying impact will be that customers and states and ports will take the lead in coming up with their own expectations and therefore their own solutions. So it's incumbent on owners and operators to be themselves flexible and able to reach those those solutions because it is going to be so hard to make investment decisions when you're not sure what the global playing field will look like in five to 10 years from now. Great, Cam, thank you very much. And uh, maybe we could also hear it from you, John, uh, whether you agree with uh, Lois or, and Cam or whether you have a different take on this, please. I, I, I agree with, with, both, uh, with both Lois and, and Cam. Um, I, I don't think shipping will be the center of, uh, of COP26. But what I, what I do hope is that, you know, shipping across the entire supply chain takes notice in terms of what is happening in, in COP26. And I think one of the most important things for the industry is um, that we speak as a whole. And I know that sounds incredibly uh, challenging, but one of, my, uh, one of my concerns is that we, the shipping industry has things forced upon us um, by multiple nation states, governments, where there are unintended consequences. So I, I'm hopeful that the shipping industry as a whole can come together, have a core strategy of how we are going to get to net zero by 2050, because I do think that is going to be the new benchmark. Uh, some could say it's already the, the new benchmark. Um, but one of the other things that the shipping industry, I don't think does a good job of, and, and hopefully some of this comes out, is first of all, I mean, we're a very easy target, right? We, we have smokestacks on our ships and people see black smoke going up into the air. Um, but the reality is, I don't think we do a good enough job on 
marketing the industry in terms of how efficient we actually are compared to other modes of transportation. And more importantly, the industry is leading um, in terms of getting to that net zero uh, decarbonization goal in 2050. And I, I would hope some of that starts to come out more um, because I do think there are some real leaders, particularly people on this panel, but you know, obviously other companies within the industry. And, and I, I'm not so sure if the public understands that. And again, I, I can't stress enough, I'll probably say it several times, but I would really like to see the shipping industry come together, get on one platform um, and move forward. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, all three. Um, so in a way, I mean, if you look back to 2015, uh, international transport was not included uh, in, in the Paris Agreement either. Um, and uh, I mean, you, you touched upon it already slightly. In your view, will we see resolutions for shipping included in this year's uh, Glasgow Agreement? And if so, what do you expect there might be? And maybe we could just continue with you, John, for that one, please. I'm not so convinced there will be actual resolutions because as we were, as we were saying before, um, you know, as, uh, as ego-driven as the shipping industry is, COP26 is not about the shipping industry. Um, it certainly is going to touch the, uh, the shipping industry. Um, but I do think that what will come out of this is um, a discussion about putting more pressure on IMO, again, to ultimately get to that net zero target by 2050. Um, I think that that will be very timely as, as we're coming into the next MEPC meeting in, in November with the IMO. I think some of the other issues that, that will be discussed will be how do we level the playing field? How do we introduce new technologies from a, from a financial standpoint? Is it the levy system um, or is it a carbon, carbon tax, carbon trading system, both of which have positive and negatives? But again, as an industry, I don't think we've all been, we're all on the same page in terms of which direction we, uh, we want to go. I, I do think one of the main, you know, one of the other main issues around this will be establishing uh, research and development funds, infrastructure funds, and financing. I think financing will, in, in general, be, will be a big topic of COP26. And the shipping industry, I, you know, in my view, is, is well short on the, on the financing side. And so I, I do hope there is much more discussion around, do we do a levy system? Do we do a carbon trading system? Um, you know, as, as I look at it, I, I can give you my, my, you know, my initial opinion is, you know, I, I have a hard time getting my head around a carbon trading system just because of there's just so many moving parts in so many countries. Whereas if we went to more of a general levy system that everyone can agree on, it, it's, it's, it's known and, and you can uh, touch and feel it, so to speak. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Um, Bo, thank you so much for being patient and, and sort of waiting out the first uh, couple of, of punches here, but uh, I'm keen to hear from you now. What's your take on this, please? Thank you very much, uh, Knut. So um, I agree to, to what has been said. And so if I was just to add uh, a bit to that, I would say that um, it is, I think there's a great opportunity here because the member states meeting up now in the COP system are basically the same member states going to the IMO. And as IMO has moved from very much of technical regulation to including also elements of politics around the climate issue with developing countries and developing countries, et cetera, I think it's extremely important to leverage the COP system to give guidance uh, to the IMO and put as much uh, pressure on IMO as possible. I would uh, also find it hard to believe that we get a real uh, resolution here, but let's see, let's, let's push it as far as we possibly can. And then uh, in this, it's also important to realize uh, in addition to, to what John said, that it's certainly about the new fuels and, and developing, uh, designing a good mechanism for incentivizing and drive out energy efficiency. 
the energy efficiency has gotten off to a good start. Uh, believe with the current uh, regulations being discussed, there's, there's much more mileage. There's so much more juice uh, in that uh, fruit. So, so we should really also remember that energy efficiency is going to play a major role uh, in this. And then thirdly, I think also the fact that uh, we're talking very much about 2050. And from our side, we have also been working hard to demonstrate that it is possible to decarbonize shipping by 2050. It is, however, also important uh, to look at the intermediate milestones at 2030 and 2040 and see how far we can actually push decarbonization on that timeline. And here, I really believe that shipping is a hard to abate sector. And for some segments of shipping, it's going to be tremendously difficult to decarbonize on the timeline of the Paris Agreement. So we need some really insightful and informed discussions about what is actually possible and what is the right thing to do so that the globe uh, actually gets as much decarbonization as possible with the resources invested. So yes, I, I think uh, Knut, that we're looking at a COP26 where shipping is not in primary focus, but it is very important that we address uh, shipping here and they give, I would say, a lot of momentum, a lot of guidance, a lot of pressure, actually, to, uh, to the IMO uh, processes upcoming. Thank you very much, uh, Bo, for those comments. We, we lost you for a little bit of time there. I'm not sure if it was only my connection, but um, you, you staggered a little bit, but it seemed to be uh, working well again. So thanks for those uh, comments. Uh, Cameron, anything that you would like to add on this specific point, please? Uh, <laughs> not, not too much to add, Newt. Um, like I said, I, I, we, we consider ourselves a small player in a very, very large uh, global machine, and uh, and uh, you know the we're not terribly engaged in the politics of it all, but but trying to run our business on what we expect to happen, rather than what we hope or want to happen. And uh, again, I hate to be the cynical view here, but history is not on the side of great uh, decisive achievements coming out of of IMO. So in the meantime, what do we do? We uh, study our options carefully. Uh, we invest in optionality a great deal to the extent we have to make capital uh, allocation decisions. Um, and we focus on compliance and servicing the customers in those, say, uh, more rigorous parts of the world. Um, and that, that is how we're gonna, how we're gonna carry on here, as I'm sure the others would agree. I see a lot of nodding, uh, Cameron, so I think you hit a, hit a point. Um, let, let us turn a little bit to where we're at at, the, at this point in time and what's going on, uh, especially on, on, the, on the research side. So uh, if I could come to you, Bob, for the first question in this, uh, on this topic. If you look at you know, the numerous research projects and international collaborations underway today. Uh, where do you see the energy transition in shipping heading in the midterm leading up to say 2030 and, and maybe also as far as 2050, please? Thank you, uh, Knut. Uh, I think we're seeing a lot of uh, tremendous uh, research sort of think tank work being put forward uh, also by by DNV and by a number of other companies and universities and think tanks and so on. And I think the, the general picture of what we're seeing is that there's a large momentum, there's a lot of it uh, to get the transition going with the needed speed. It's going to be a, it's going to be a big challenge. It's, it's probably very much a matter of change management and leadership rather than uh, new inventions uh, coming out. We, lead, we need a lot of innovation. We need a lot of development of, of known technologies and pathways, whether it's uh, ammonia or hydrogen or some of the derivatives. We know that's going to be needed, but we're basically saying that we don't need sort of really breakthrough uh, innovation to do it. We don't need fusion energy. Uh, for example, to do it. So it's very much about development and, uh, and scaling and getting it going. 
And, and in that, there is an important interplay between research and government and industry leaders. And I really think now that uh, what, what Cam mentioned earlier is, is of essence here. The fact that we find it um, because there are customers today who are willing to pay a green premium for decarbonized shipping. There are ports today that can supply green fuels. Um, there are energy companies that can supply the green fuels, etc. So there are ways of actually getting going. And we have to be careful not to sort of tell them and give the narrative that we need to wait for global regulation to get going. That's really not the case. So we're working very much from the idea that there are basically two, uh, two lanes um, moving at different frequencies. So there's a, there's a research lane that needs to address some of the really big potentials in this. And then there's also a, a scaling and engineering and implementation lane that enables the solution that are actually what we're seeing now is that industry leaders are actually taking action both on the government side and also in the private sector side to start getting going and i just want to emphasize that even if we need research it's also extremely important for all of us to to understand that that and our chance is that we can actually get going without breakthrough innovations and without uh, global policy. There is a way to get going. And that those initial learnings will support, will create an understanding for where is more research needed. And it will create confidence in the regulatory processes to say it is possible to decarbonize shipping with these uh, implications. So let's now design and implement a regulatory system that truly benefits, that is practical enforceable and truly benefits uh, the, the climate. Thank you, Bo. Um, so John, um, it raises the question then, which uh, lane are you in? Are you in the fast swimming lane or how, how would you take on this question, please? I, you know, I think, um, I think Bo brings up a great point and, and that is um, we're, we're not uh, putting astronauts in the, uh, you know, on the moon in 1969. You know, what, what we're really talking about, is, as Bo said, is, is getting going um, and getting monies in place to build out infrastructure, to produce, you know, whatever the winning fuel is going to be. And by the way, I actually don't think there will be one winning fuel. Um, I think it's going to be a mix because, again, shipping is going to be competing with power plants, with aircraft, with trucking, with rail. Um, so I, I think there will be multiple solutions on this. I, I also believe um, while we're leading um, to some degree on the owner side, though no, not as much as, as, I as I would like to see in general, um, at least in dry bulk shipping, and, and I know I've seen this on the tanker side as well, major charters are partnering with ship owners um, and as Bo brought up, are willing to pay a, a, you know, a little bit more um, to try to move much more towards green technology. Um, what's interesting on in the dry bulk side, and, and you know, obviously I'm, I'm going to let Lois speak about the tankers if she wants. I don't want to get into her wheelhouse. But um, on the dry bulk side, what we're seeing is more skipping over um, the LNG side of it. Um, and moving more towards whether it's methanol or ammonia, um, particularly with the iron ore majors. Um, we've seen both BHP and Rio cut back on some of their LNG orders and, and Fortescue, they seem to really be leading right now in that they have you know, canceled their, uh, their MOUs on, on LNG propulsion and are moving straight into ammonia and even converting some of their existing Cape size vessels um, over to, to ammonia, to green ammonia ultimately. Um, and I think that's one of the, that's one of the major uh, forces that needs to continue is that partnership, be, you know, starting out with probably the iron ore majors and dry bulk ship owners, um, but also moving down into some of the larger companies that may transport grain um, or some other other commodities, and and again, I, I'm I'm op very optimistic about that, and and I I echo what Bo is saying. This um, you know we have what we need. We just need to get going um, on this. 
Great, thanks, uh, John. And um, and having that as the as, as a backdrop, Louis, from the bulker uh, sector, what's the take uh, from your end, please? Yeah, so the, the commonality would be, you know, uh, the large customers in our industry, similar to you know what John's talking about on the dry cargo, right? So you know, you have the shells, you have the totals out there, you know, leading with. And you know, I, I will talk a little bit because it's it's some, we're building three dual fuel uh, LNG powered VLCCs right now, and those will be on charter to shell for seven years. And you know, if you look at one of those Bs versus a ten year old VLCC, you're uh, talking about a forty percent increase in efficiency, right? So you know, when I started in the industry, um, you know, we had steam powered VLCCs that were burning you know, 100 tons a day, right? You know, where the equivalent now of when these bees are delivered, um, they would be burning the equivalent of 33 tons a day. So you, you see that step change and these are things that are happening now. Those vessels will be delivered in just over a year's time. So, you know, I think that, you know, there will be, you know, a role for LNG as a bridge fuel. I think that, you know, we will have the methanol power, we will have ammonia power. And I think, you know, right now as an owner, you know, we're looking to yourselves, the classification societies who are out in front with their top engineers, you know, really looking at, okay, you know, what will we be able to, because we haven't talked about cost. You got to pay for the fuel that runs your ship, right? As Cameron said, we're running a business here, right? So, um, you know, we are we are trying to press forward, achieve efficiencies, and you know, be able to run a business that you know uh, is sustainable. So I think we bring all you know all of those pieces together. Great, thank you. Um... You know, this is certainly a fascinating discussion, but, and uh, I, I feel so tempted to sort of come out with my own views, but I'm just the moderator, so <laughs> I will try to stick to the question. So uh, if I could stay with you, uh, Louise, for the next uh, question as well. Um, you know, on the overall picture, the transport sector is responsible for about 20% of the global CO2 emissions, of which shipping makes up less than 3%. So that's sort of the overall picture. Now, this implies that some of you already mentioned that, you know, cars, trucks, trains, and planes will also scramble for access to low carbon fuels. And, uh, you know, the, the question is really quite straightforward. How can shipping source the volumes needed for green ammonia or green methanol as examples? Louise, please. You know, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the tricky piece of it is, um, you know, that we are not stationary, right? In other words, we don't, you know, there are some routes that, you know, like for a VLCC, you're going to be passing Singapore all the time. But, you know, we don't have one central hub where we can, where we can access fuel. Um, on the other hand, for example, the uh, 50 VLGCCs that were ordered this year are all will be powered dual fuel and they're LPG. So... I would say to some degree, you know, when you're in the tanker space or you're, you know, um, you know, you're working with players that supply a lot of LNG, for example, with RVs where Shell has, you know, one of the largest proven reserves of LNG, we're going to have access to that LNG. The LPG vessels are going to have access to um, LPG as fuel. And then as we get into the, you know, net zero world and we're looking for you know, ha having access to economic fuels, you know, I think that as um, the world develops and cuts one way or the other, and I, I don't think it will be one solution, but everything will be become more plentiful and more economic. Otherwise, it won't be one of the chosen fuels. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, Cameron. Let's hear it from you on this question, please. Um, it, it brings to mind the current state of transistors and microchips where nobody can find them. And it takes 
five years to build a fab. And so you, you think about that in light of the demand for methanol and the potential uh, capacity constraints on that system if it's adopted too quickly and recklessly. I think that um, you know shipping people are, are quite conditioned to moving methodically and carefully. Um, and, and so procuring that fuel and knowing the capacity of that fuel system is going to be something that's quite critical to anybody making an investment in a, in a you know, new propulsion system. And in the meantime, you know, we look at the, the operative word net in, in net zero, which is, you know, these are long lived uh, capital assets. There are steps we can take, whether it's onboard carbon capture or other fuel efficiency measures or the other side of the net on the balance sheet, on the energy balance sheet, um, so that we move in a way that takes, say, maybe not quick enough for, for some uh, listening to this call, but in a methodical way that doesn't stress out that system or run into the unintended consequences of there's not enough fuel uh, to supply the ships that have all been ordered because we all thought we were moving in, in a certain pace and certain parts of that infrastructure didn't agree with us. Thanks, great. Um, Bo, um, you have been, um, say, associated with uh, methanol, if I sort of uh, referred to a recent MERSC order, so you might have used on this as well, please. Maybe I should here I emphasize that uh, we, are, we are an independent research center, actually, but you're absolutely right that MERSC has now gone with methanol, and methanol is the available fuel that has the green fuel uh, that has, uh, you, can, you can basically implement that immediately, the engines and regulations and, and everything is in place. So that is actually an example of a way to get going on something which is, uh, which is scalable. Now, I, I would like to uh, re-emphasize, uh, Knut, what you said about uh, competition in the bigger energy picture, because this is extremely important. Um, and first of all, I believe that uh, I mean, we talk about uh, the production cost of these future fuels. So if you take, it doesn't give you any information. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We hear you now, Bob, but you were breaking up a little bit just uh, a few seconds ago. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Just repeat the last part. So you can estimate the production, nominal production cost from these different processes, new global competition. This, uh, the globe is hopefully decarbonizing across sectors and countries. I mean, we will be seeing a need for a massive scale of these green fuels. So I think this is just important to bear in mind here when we go in and design, for example, the regulations that one needs to understand uh, the investment risks here. Uh, so this is a part of it, you know, that if we just prescribe a decarbonization curve, um, you know, the cost of these uh, fuels could be very, very large. So we need to find a smart combination of market-based measures with some common pricing together with some technical regulation. So that's one thing. Secondly, I think uh, that shipping has historically been able to make, take advantage of the physical features uh, of, of the assets we're running. You know, So a ship has large uh, cargo carrying capacity and large volume. So we don't need to run on the same high grade fuels that trucks and airplanes are running on. So there might just be ways in the future of finding lower grade fuels that are waste products from, you know, biorefineries or lower grade uh, synthetic fuels, et cetera, that we could make use of. And then finally, I think the speed uh, of scaling up is the big question. And I think uh, we all need to have actually a look at how we scale these systems sufficiently fast. Because as you said, shipping is only 3%. Uh, so, so if you look at the total scale, it is just enormous. 
And this means that some of the things that are maybe controversial, like uh, nuclear and blue fuels with carbon capture and storage, I really think that we need to have a renewed look at this, uh, step back and ha just have a look at, at what is it actually, what are the options? And, and, you know, not shy away from actually investigating some of these options that, that are, you know, controversial and, and have been deselected for, for reasons previously. Thank you, Bo. Um, it, just a, a quick comment from me. It's a little bit of a paradox these days in Germany, for instance, they're phasing out the nuclear uh, power plants and uh, <laughs> it's basically being replaced by coal-fired power plants, which is absolutely not doing anything for what we are talking about now. Uh, leaving that aside, uh, let us um, move a, a little bit on towards the, the financing part. And uh, if I could come to you, Cameron, for this one first. A year on from implementing the Poseidon principles in, in shipping, where do you see our industry's progress towards creating financial incentives for decarbonization? And uh, are there other measures that you expect to see in the near future, like carbon tax, emission trading systems. I know that some of you touched upon this uh, a little bit earlier on in the call. Please, Ken. Uh, I'll be brief, but yes and all, right? So the, the incentives will continue to increase. They will be not harmonized or uh, consistent, but they'll be multifaceted and from multiple sources, whether it's equity or debt, um, or from, from places we don't expect, uh, suppliers, for example, uh, customers. Um, so uh, we expect that to, to actually only um, increase. And it's something we're, as I'm sure the others are on this call, keenly, keenly focused on. But we're delighted. I mean, I, you know, by the time you're uh, public or in the Western world and involved in shipping, uh, you're already focused on, uh, say, leading edge of, of high customer and regulatory demands. So I think it's something that we're all quite attuned to. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, and Luis, um, in agreement or in disagreement with Cameron on this, please? You know, uh, in early 2020, we did, uh, the, you know, first publicly linked Poseidon Principles debt facility. And a year and a half on, I think everything has, you know, you, you start out simply with reporting and consistency and um, have that independently verified. And then, you know, now, you know, it's um, everything starts to tighten and increase um, to, to bring in targets. And, you know, so I, I think that, you know, you, we will continue to see, you know, a tightening, a, a heightening of uh, standards. And as Cameron said, from every party that's involved in uh, shipping, financing, every part of the chain uh, is interested in what are you doing? Um, you know, yes, for all of ESG, mostly for the, for the decarbonization or the E piece of that equation. So, you know, um, we recently did uh, in one of the pools that we're in, we did a uh, net zero voyage uh, with, with carbon credits, uh, working with um, the, the pool owners at Penfield. And, you know, I think that from every angle, every piece of the chain, it's going to get more and more challenging on, you know, what are you doing today? Not just are you, what are you planning for tomorrow? Great, thank you, Luis. Uh, John, please. Uh, well, look, I, I I agree with uh, with Cam and and Lois. I um, I'll take a, a slightly different view in that while what the banks have done, they they've made a lot of progress, um, which I think is very positive. But I will say the you know the five to fifteen basis points that you get is pretty minimal. Um, so of course you'd like to see those, uh, that those numbers go up. Um, I don't think they will, um, because I think bank capital in general is, is fairly inexpensive capital. So there's probably not a room, a lot of, not a lot of room or financial incentive from, on the banks from a balance sheet standpoint to be able to do that though. 
again, I, you know, I'll, I'll introduce, you know, CII. We haven't talked about this. I actually think the banks will use that as, as we go forward over the next couple of years where they will simply shy away or, or in a worst case, you know, call defaults on, on ships that, you know, that don't have a, don't have a high letter grading, you know, whether it's a D or an E for, for a period of time. So I, I actually think that could be a mechanism where you'll see the bank lending tighten up um, even more. Um, but, but I, I don't, I don't necessarily see uh, capital getting any cheaper um, than it is today from a green standpoint with banks anyway. Um, you know, I'll, I will, I will just add one thing, which just to step away from the banks, I think the charters are going to play a big role in this as well. Um, I think uh, particularly larger charters will apply pressure on ship owners and you may find yourself not being able to, to work with a, with a certain shipper, um, you know, if you're, if your letter grade um, and your environmental footprint um, exceeds their expectations. So I think there'll be some pushback on that as well. That's a great uh, point, John, and um, and your reference to you know the the carbon intensity index is certainly a, a nice bridge into our last question, uh, which I also see that many of, of the people in the audience are, are keen to know. So um, I will let everyone have a short stab at this one. So to avoid having stranded assets, um, how will you ensure that your vessels meet the growth? expectations that you have all now touched upon on more stringent regulations for efficiency and, and tightening emission requirements. And this is not, as, as we know, not only by the regulators, it's also by the cargo owners and the, and the finance community. So maybe I could just start with you, Bo, and then we just do a quick round, please. So this is one of the major uh, risks that we are working on to provide risk mitigation for exactly that. And a part of it, a large part of it comes from uh, building optionality in, uh, into the ships as was previously mentioned. So maybe I shouldn't uh, given the time left, but, but that, is certainly, that is certainly one way of, mi of mitigating, either building it in today or preparing the ships to do it. So if I was to say just one thing, that would be the one, thanks. Great, appreciate that um, that comment, um, uh, Cameron. Please quickly. You need to unmute, uh, Cameron. Sorry, it's probably because I was just copying what Bo was going to say or did say. Um, so we believe in building optionality into the into the vessel itself, um, and additionally, if you look again at, at recent years, you'll see that there's a lot that can be done where the rents are shared or the balance of investment return comes from the customer or the end user of the, of the ship. And so it actually becomes a positive ROI step for us to take. Great. John, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, to, to bridge off of Cam there, you know, we, we, are, we are doing several things to our existing fleet. We've been cycling out of our, our older Less fuel efficient tonnage and and focusing on uh, on acquisitions that are that are eco type ships much more uh, much more fuel efficient. We've also made the decision that we are we're not going to be ordering new ships that have conventional fuel uh, fired engines. Um, we're we're part of a, a larger group of of ship owners, mining companies, and uh, fuel providers to study the use of ammonia. Um, I, you know, I, I still think ammonia and methanol, at least for, for, um, for longer haul voyages is at least right now going to be, uh, the, the way to go. But from just a vessel standpoint on the fleet, you know, we're installing EPLs, we're, we're installing high performance paints. We are doing a, a real heavy lift on making sure all of our ships are, are, are outfitted with, with data gathering devices. And I put all this together. And, and it feels really good to say this, this, this is a win-win situation. There, there is a return on investment. There is a payback period. You know, this, this is not like installing ballast water treatment systems. Um, there, there is a real financial win for a company, but then there's also obviously the win on the uh, environmental side. Thank you, John. Uh, Luis, 30 seconds, please. Yeah, so absolutely, we would not uh, just build a conventional engine today. You know, at a minimum, I think everyone, you know, placing orders today has to be uh, 
able to accommodate a, a flip to green fuels at a minimum. And all the ships that are on the water, exactly as John is saying, you know, you're looking at the slick paints, the Mavis ducks, the, you know, the boss cats, the, you know, are we going to do a bubble carpet? You know, what are you going to do so you can grab 5% here, 3% there of efficiency um, to help us meet the, to meet the targets and to decarbonize? Great, thank you so much. Uh, 45 minutes really went away like a rocket. And uh, I, I just want to thank you all, Louise and gentlemen, for taking part, spending uh, the time with us and, and not least sharing your insights. So thank you all very much. And I'll hand it uh, straight back over to you, Nicholas. Thank you. Mine intervention is the easiest because all I have to do is say thank you for a tremendous panel. Uh, you always do a great job and thank you. I mean, it's a great topic and uh, I really appreciate your insight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Sure. Thank you.